Thank you. Well, I'm a neuroscientist, but I started my career as a marine biologist. And uh, when I was a student, I had a part-time job working for the California Department of Fish and Game. And my job was to survey the catch and determine what species they were catching in the age, um, survey the population so that the government could form regulations to manage the, the fishery reasonably. Um, the entire rockfish industry in Monterey Bay collapsed uh, subsequently. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> one of the benefits of the job, anyway, as a hungry graduate student was all the fresh fish that you could get. Um, Anything that had no commercial value just went overboard to the crabs or they gave to the kid from the fish and game department. So I was sorting through tons of rockfish on the deck of a trawler and the skipper comes over and he says, hey, look at this. And I looked at this thing that had no resemblance to fish. It was flaccid like liver. It had no scales, no tail like a fish no bones in its body. And I'd never seen one before, but I, I knew what it was from a textbook. And it was a chimera. So a chimera is a deep sea fish that's a living relic. And these fish were living in ancient seas before any animals with, with back, uh, bones ever appeared on Earth. <clears throat> so these are the most primitive fish uh, living organisms on Earth with jaws. And they had enormous green eyes that, that shined a green light like a deer in the headlight. This was for vision in the deep sea. It had a poisonous, well, it had a buck teeth. And this, with the eyes, gave it the name of water rabbit. It didn't have a fish tail. It had a long tendril like a snake tail, which gave it its other name, ratfish, and a poisonous spine on its back. And the males had appendages like legs, and another appendage that came out of the forehead like a club with cat claws on the end, and these were all used in mating somehow. <laughs> so I looked at this creature, and, and I realized what I was seeing. Dinner. <laughs> so while I was gutting the fish for dinner, I noticed that it had these pores all over the head. And I peeled back the skin, and underneath the pores, there were these clear tubes, and they came to a mass in the middle of the fish's head, like a radar dome-type nose it had. And I wondered, could these be the organs, like those that had just been discovered in sharks, that allow sharks to sense electric fields that all animals have around them in seawater? And that's how they find their prey. So my wife said, well, there's your master's thesis. And I'd been looking for my master's thesis. I just didn't expect to find it on my plate. The problem is how to get one. So we went out with our research vessel and we tried to collect them, but they're very rare and the few we got were roadkill. They were just mangled by the net. So it was looking like the ratfish as a project was going to be about as promising as it was as a dinner. And then one day the phone rang and a skipper of a party boat who knew I wanted a ratfish desperately had seen one of his patrons catch one, a very rare event. He snatched it away, radioed ashore, told me to come and meet him. I showed up with a garbage can full of seawater, put it in the back of the VW bus, and went back to the lab with a live ratfish. And I had no time to, to prepare for my experiments, and so I found an abandoned ring-shaped ring aquarium in the back of the lab, started the water going through that, and that would keep the fish from banging itself against the side. And I sat inside this ring-shaped aquarium and watch the fish go around. And I knew that ratfish had never been kept in captivity because they wouldn't feed, and I only had a, a few days. How was I going to test that this fish could sense electric fields? Suddenly I realized that this one behavior that it had swimming against the current might be used to test that. So I made some electrodes, put them underneath the sand, and I used special uh, electronic amplifiers so that I could generate electric field just like that around a normal fish. And when the ratfish swam over these electrodes, I gently tapped it with a rod to force him to turn around. See, my idea was, if the fish could sense electric fields, it would learn to associate me turning on the switch with the glass rod, and it would turn without any prodding. And that would prove that it could sense electric fields. And if it didn't do that, it would prove that it 
couldn't sense electric fields or prove that you can't train fish. <laughs> so, so I was 24 hours a day working in this aquarium, watching the fish going around, trying to train it. And it was during summer break. Everyone else was gone. And then in the middle of the night, suddenly I flipped the switch three days before Christmas, and the ratfish turned. So the moment of discovery. Then working with a, a colleague who was a neurophysiologist, we recorded the electrical impulses going from these strange tubes to the brain, and we could hear those impulses like hailstorm when we, when we turned on an electric field. And then I looked at these organs underneath the elect electron microscope, and they had the features of a sense organ. So I wrote up this paper, sent it off to Science, a magazine, a journal called Science, and that was my first scientific publication. And I think the editors had no idea that we did behavior, anatomy, and physiology all from one animal. I'll put that in the paper. <laughs> so possibly the discovery of a sixth sense may give insights into how other sense organs work, vision, and maybe be useful for treating, finding new discoveries for deafness or something. But let's be honest, that's not what motivated me. That's not what motivated the fisherman when he snatched the fish away from his patron and radioed ashore. And he had no illusions that he was looking for the cure of cancer or something. He just wanted to know. So often science is explained to the public and and justified for government funding on the basis of the practical value, curing disease, um, technological advance. But that's easy. That's not the only reason we do science. Science is at the core of the human soul, the wonder. Human beings have this compelling need to explore nature and to understand the world around us. I think we're all scientists. Some of us get to do it every day, but everyone else in society supports that by donating the money and the support for science. It's a group effort. And that's why the moment of discovery, when the fish turns, unleashes this strange sense of emotions. It's not the feeling of, of winning a race or summiting a mountain and looking down in triumph. It's a feeling of profound gratitude for the insight into nature that's been revealed to you and companionship with many, many people through space and time who brought you to that moment. And discovery's fragile. <laughs> These insights into nature come in fleeting opportunities. What if the skipper had just tossed that fish over to the crabs without a word? What if I hadn't cooked it up for dinner? What if the skipper hadn't grabbed it away from his patron and called me up? Scientists are, are dreamers and uncommonly willing to risk failure. Uh, but they're supported by all their citizens, other citizens in society, who ask for nothing in return except that researchers tell them what it is they discovered. And so this reminds me of an experience I had when I was high school age that has stuck with me the rest of my life. I grew up in Cupertino, California, which many now know is the birthplace of the Apple computer. So it's a residential area. And one day, I was out in my backyard, and I looked up on the telephone wire, and there was a hawk. Now, a hawk in the tract homes of Cupertino is a pretty rare sight. So I looked up at the hawk, and I had this idea. Wouldn't it be great if I could get that hawk to fly down from the wire and land on my hand as though I were a falconer. <laughs> so I went into the kitchen, cut up some meat, raw meat, <laughs> went back out to the backyard, held the meat up. I looked at the raptor, and I could see his beady eyes, and he looked down, and I held my hand steady. It was a pretty silly thing to do. <laughs> But suddenly, the hawk flared up, expanded its wings, and swooped down, heading right for my hand. It was the most thrilling, terrifying, 
sight you can imagine. To this day, I still remember its beady eyes, its magnificent outstretched wings, razor bill, talons. <laughs> <laughs> it was a rare, rare insight into nature that, that few will ever know. <laughs> but then I recalled, what's the first thing you notice about a falconer? They all wear these leather <laughs> gloves that go from their fingertips up to their shoulder. I was wearing a t-shirt. <laughs> and I just had the bloody meat in my bare hands. So with the hawk halfway between his perch and my hand, this thought bubbles up to my left cerebral cortex. W what are you doing? <laughs> It's a hawk, not a squirrel. <laughs> okay. Hawks eat squirrels. But I was transfixed. The magnificent insight into nature that was unfolding was too magnificent to let slip away. And so I held my hand there. The hawk came within a foot of my hand. It flared back its wings, it extended out its talons, and then it curled them up into a fist and landed on my bare wrist, on its knuckles. Then he began to gingerly eat the meat from my hand, and when he was done, flew back up to the wire. That scene repeated itself every day for two weeks, and then the hawk was gone, and I never saw it again. But that experience never left me. That magnificent combination of, of thrill and excitement and the awesome beauty of nature. The gift, the amazing gift of having this experience, this is the emotion of the moment of discovery. The awesome gift of having nature come up and tap you on the shoulder and share a secret with you, a long-held secret, and share it with you alone. Discovery is, is, is powerful and it's humbling. And none of that would have ever happened if I hadn't extended my hand. Thank you. <laughs>